For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into the study. Messianic firstborn. I give you a moment of silence uh, to examine your life in regard to personal sin. We're into the mechanics of Bible study, classroom etiquette. For those who are visiting with us by internet, we, re we request that you do the same classroom etiquette in your home or wherever you're studying with us from. <clears throat> Maybe your dormitory. And the reason is that if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, because you live in the church age, the moment you got, the moment you believed, you received. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your body became the temple of God, and he dwells there forever, John 14, 16. And the reason is to bring spirituality to your life. The Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead, takes residence in your life, and that's how you can be spiritual. You can't be spiritual any other way. Now, the mechanics is you can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. That would be three categories you could examine. If you're in carnality, you've grieved the Holy Spirit. He's been quenched. He convicts. This brings you to the responsibility, okay, what do I do to get out of carnality into spirituality where he can minister the Word of God to my life? And that is confession of sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And that this is not about salvation. This is about sanctification. This is how to be spiritual. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that through your own priesthood. That's your responsibility. But that is classroom etiquette. At least for this study. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these who have come our way by automobile and by Internet. And we pray, Father, we would take serious classroom etiquette because it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit that will teach us and recall what he's taught us from our souls to life experience. We learn the Bible to live it. We, we live it by faith so that grace can work in our life. So I pray today, Father, we've taken the, the classroom etiquette part of this serious. We've confessed our sins. We're looking to the Holy Spirit to teach us, and he will certainly do it tonight in this study. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> what is interesting about firstborn is how many other nations um, developed a system off from it. Now, we would expect some of those that were influenced by Israel to do it. For example, the Ishmaelites, you know, Ishmael, Hagar, Abraham, and Ishmael. The Ishmaelites sat at meal based on firstborn order, just like the Jews. Um, in Genesis 43, 33, uh, we see the Israelites we see the Israelites, now they were seated before him, Joseph, in Egypt, the firstborn according to his birthrights, and the youngest according to his youth, and the men looked at one another in astonishment. People were amazed that they did that. The Ishmaelites in Genesis uh, did the same thing. Um, when they listed the genealogy of these, the names of the son of Ishmael by their names in the order of their birth. In Psalms 87, 27, the firstborn becomes a title, a messianic title that's important to us. I shall make my firstborn the highest of the kings of the earth. we think more of that in regard to the second coming of Christ than we do the first coming because in the first coming, 
uh, his mission is to go to become a lamb that takes away the sin of the world and not a king who rules a kingdom. But this is a messianic title for Christ when he returns in what we call the second coming to reign in the millennium. Uh, this is brought out in Revelation in the first chapter, verse 5, and, and then goes on to the 19th chapter uh, in regard to, you know, like I think it's uh, Revelation 19, 16, where he says that he is the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. There's your reference there. But in Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's a revelation. That's a preview of coming attraction. To him who loves us and released us. Isn't it interesting how the writer sums that up at John in Revelation? Here's what you're missing. See the love and the word released? The, the love that loves us, that's present. Released is past. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. I want to talk about three things tonight about Messianic firstborn as a, a biblical reference. Number one, I want you to see that the firstborn has been taken. The concept of firstborn was taken or at least made illustration as an illustration from the divine institution of family. And it was done this way to make a doctrinal point about the spiritual family of God. We're all going to wind up in Christ firstborn in the family of God. We are, look, and look, I don't know how far down the food chain I'm in. Uh, you know what I mean as far as salvation? I mean, I'm way down the line though, right? I mean, the rest of you are too. Why do you look at me like, well, you rest of you down the line pretty good ways yourself. Uh, is it like, well, you're way down there, but but listen, we're we're looked at as the firstborn, but we're looked at as as firstborn. We're the firstborn. That's kind of interesting, and and so this whole concept, firstborn, is to take us there. Now, I want to I want to mention five things to you that I think might be important about this concept. The extension of specific genealogies of the human race, which we today call family tree, right? Began with Adam and Eve. They were the origin of the human race to Jesus Christ. You know what's interesting? It stopped with him. This whole accountable, this accountability uh, of fallen humanity while, there, while that continues, the whole concept of firstborn, we're done when we get to Jesus Christ. That whole, look, let me show you what I mean. This will make a little more sense. I'll put your eyes on it, okay? Go with me to Luke 3 a moment. Just go to Luke 3 a moment. We're just going to look at this because I want you to see what I just said. I want you to see what I just said. Okay. Now, in verse 23, third chapter, verse 23, we have Jesus Christ. Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, about, being supposedly the son of Joseph, okay? The son of Eli. Now we start going down the sun chain. And we go all the way down to verse 38 where we get to the origin. This is where it all started. God, Adam, Seth. Right? Verse 38. Then we go up the sun chain all the way to Jesus. And you know what? We're done. Because he's the fulfillment of it. And if you're in Christ, then this is your family tree. Spiritual, that's your spiritual family tree. Agreed? In Christ. The moment you believe you are baptized into Christ and become a new cre creation, a new creature, right? 
So this whole genealogy walk takes us to Christ and there's where, where the fulfillment of it is. You see that? So the origin begins with God and then moves to Adam, Adam and Eve being the, ori the, the original human race origin. Okay. <clears throat> the second thing that's of interest, that's the first. The second of the interest is that Abraham was a Shemite. You know, when Noah, Noah had three sons. And the lineage is going to go to Shem's, through Shem. You know, from Seth, it's going to go from Adam to Seth. And then from Noah, it's going to go, and he's the last of the, the Sethites. Then it's going to go to Sham and the Shamites. Are, are you with me? This is recorded in Genesis 11, 10 through 27. Abraham is the last Shemite because he's the father of a new race. Did I say what? You said eight, the eighth. Adam, I mean, Abraham was the eighth Shemite. The last. He was the last Shemite. He was the last Shemite, but he's the first. He's the father of the Jewish people, isn't he? See, that's part of the Abrahamic covenant. The seed, the seed of, of, of Abraham. See, that's at Galatians 3.16. And, and how he, he wasn't known as the Jew then, that, that doesn't come until after the captivity. They were known, he was known as the Hebrew. He was known as the Hebrew. In fact, when they, went into, when, when they go into Egypt, they're known as the Hebrews. Those who crossed over, the, they're known as Hebrews. And I gave you some passages on that. The third thing of significance in this study is Jacob. See, I'm trying to show you how the family, how the, how the firstborn is being maneuvered around. Jacob was Hebrew, whose first three sons failed to maintain first, firstborn status, right? Reuben lost it, Simeon lost it, Levi lost it, and went to the fourth son, Judah, which carried the firstborn status. That's how Jesus Christ is of the tribe of Judah, of the house of David, and he's the firstborn. I mean, he's the fulfillment of this whole deal. <clears throat> and this is being laid out by, uh, J by Jacob in this uh, prophecy of Genesis 49. The fourth thing that I think might be important is that the firstborn, this, and this was interesting to me. I caught this some while back. The firstborn among the human race in Egypt was significant. Not just the firstborn of Israel, but the firstborn of Egypt. You remember the last, pl the last plague that Moses had was the death of the firstborn, Right? And it was against every firstborn of Egypt and Israel. Firstborn was significant to Israel. It was also significant uh, to the Egyptians. And he didn't take the secondborn. He didn't take the thirstborn. He said, I'm going to take the firstborn across, right across the board. And when Israel leaves Egypt, the firstborn takes on a significant doctrinal messianic appeal. In fact, there is a whole, there is a whole doctrinal outline of, re, of firstborn responsibility 
that's given beyond what the patriarchs had. It says, like in Psalm 78, 51, that he smote the firstborn in Egypt, the first issue of the root, ver, ver, you got it, in the tents of Ham. You know, he's, you know, when he says the tents of Ham, he's referring to Egypt. And you can see other aspects. I, I laid out other things in there. Um, but in that la plague, if you didn't have blood over the doorpost, right, the death angel got you. And listen, if you study the Exodus, you will see that many Egyptians left Egypt along with the Israelites. You know why? They put blood over their post. And when, when, when Israel left, they left with him. <clears throat> Here's the fifth thing. The Hebrews in Egypt. In Hebrews eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, By faith he, Moses, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood. Now, when you read the account, they, they, for better, for us, for modern name, they put a, they put a, have you ever seen people barbecue and they have these uh, short handle mops? Uh -huh. And they stick it in that and, and then they slab it on all that and then we pay money and eat that and then get sick. <laughs> and, well, that, if you've got that picture in your mind, not getting sick from it, but if you've got that picture of that shorthand thing, now you understand what they did with the blood of the animal over the doorpost. When it says sprinkle, I, I don't know what, it, they, 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 they mopped that. I mean, they made sure that death angel would definitely see that blood. Right? Um, they didn't. They didn't just put a little here and a little there and save the rest because might need it. Uh, so this is a concept. And, and look, this, this is related to, he, to Moses in uh, Hebrews 11. And it says, and, and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch him. And we know that story, the death angel. See, all, and listen, look, look, I put it in bold print. And w so that what wouldn't be destroyed? The firstborn. Let me tell you that the firstborn was essential to Israel. It was also essential. They, in other words, there were a lot of nations that had things established that things, and Egypt was one of those nations. And, uh, but anyhow, here's the second thing. The first messianic firstborn lineage began with Adam and covered the antediluvian civilization. This is kind of important because you see how, how God is moving the program. Now, one day with God is a thousand years comes out when you read his history. <laughs> I mean, you go through the antediluvian period and, you know, you, it's about five pages and you're done or something. And you're talking about thousands of years, see. The first messianic firstborn lineage began with Adam and covered the antediluvian civilization. It's recorded in Genesis 5, 1 through 32. And there's 10 genealogies. It goes from Adam through Seth to Noah. Adam and Eve had three kids. You know who the firstborn was? Cain. Therefore, he had firstborn rights. But he went out and killed the second, Abel, and they're both gone. And the devil thinks that he's won the biblical war. Firstborn's gone. The secondborn's gone. 
But he didn't understand God's genius. And so they have a next born, and God calls him firstborn. The devil says, that's cheating. That's cheating. Well, you don't understand, devil. Let me tell you something you've never understood about me. I am God. And listen what you don't understand. I am God Almighty. And you've never understood my word. You've never honored me. So what makes you think you have anything to contribute to what I think or what I do? That, that's my footnote on that. Adam and Eve had three children. Cain kills Abel, and God raises up Seth. Seth goes, so now we have Adam, Seth. The first line moves on. Firstborn line moves up the pike. And listen, could you not understand that? Life goes on. Your disappointments in life, there's an, a new day coming. It's called tomorrow. Tomorrow is always a new day. I have the hardest time convincing people of that. Because they, they always get stuck in the past. They always get stuck in the past. And when they do, they don't have a future. When you don't have a future, your present is stuck. Yeah, a little song, Every Day with Jesus, is what? Sweeter than the... But you got to live that day. You've got to be able to live that day and understand that God is always out front when he is. Uh, he's always out front of you. He's clearing out the path for you. All you got to do is walk it. Your present, your present is not dictated by your past. It's dictated by your future. And all of that is in the hands of God. Your day could change immediately if you understood that. I say this so much, it almost is routine. In fact, I was at the, I was at the bank the other day, and there were two tellers in there, and there was no business there, so I gave it in there. And this little lady came over, and there's a young girl in there that always waits on me, and we go through the same, every, think, the same little deal every time. But her other person came to me. When she got through, she said, have a good day. I said, oh, don't shut that door yet. I said, I look back, and there's nobody behind me. Let me tell you something. I'm going to have a good day because it's a choice. And when I said that, that young girl that I say that to 100 times, she began to laugh. As soon as I said, whoa, hold that door. Don't shut that until I have a word with you. And the lady said, oh, yes, sir. And I said, look, I'm going to have a good day because it's a choice. And she said, it's a what, sir? And, and this girl over there is going nuts. I said, well, listen, I'm going to go ahead and leave because Chloe is her name. Chloe will explain it to you. And Chloe went, I sure will. <laughs> Because I tell her that, I tell her, I tell her that every time I go banking, they say, "Well, Mr. Ron, they call me. Everybody calls me Mr. Ron. That's what happens when you get past the senior ticket." Um, but anyhow, uh, the Messianic firstborn has has been one thing has been established about the firstborn. God will move down the sun chain until He finds the one He wants. Uh, he'll, he'll remove whatever he has to move to get the firstborn in the right position. And boy, if you study the genealogy, you can see that happen. Holy mackerel. I mean, Reuben, God goes like, oh, Reuben, I got to get rid of Reuben. And then Simeon, oh, Simeon. What, look up Simeon in eternity path. Oh, man, I got to get, uh, Levi, where's Levi? Oh, man. Who's up next? Judah. All right, all right. We'll go through the exercise. See, all we have to do is be the exercise. <laughs> we got the easy part. You know that? There it is. 
What is interesting about the Adam and Eve? They have Cain, they have Abel and Seth. You know what's really interesting? Is the Messianic conflict, the, what we call the angelic conflict. I mean, how set the devil is to destroy everything about God and his son. I mean, you got... He nails them in the garden. They turn to God. God cleans them up. They get out there and they have their little house and little white picket fence. and Life is good. That is wonderful boy Cain, just a model of a firstborn. Just works hard. Free enterprise. Have Abel. Just a good second son. And they think, wow, we're ahead, let's stop. <laughs> what are the odds you can live? Our son, son, you know, he'd be from a pit of hell or someplace. So they've had these, got two sons. Our heritage is locked in. We're in pretty good shape. Let's shut it down. And as grown men, Cain murders Abel. over a spiritual ritual. Now, it's an important one. It was an important one to Adam. It was an important one to Eve. And it was an important one to uh, Abel. But it wasn't an important one to Cain. And the devil, listen, the devil thinks he's one. He's so short-minded. You can always tell anybody who thinks like him, they're so short-minded. They can't think beyond their nose, as my grandfather used to say. In Michigan, we used to have a lot of people with long noses, too, and I used to think a lot about that as a child. He thinks how you think. But here's what I'm saying. As soon as God develops something spiritual, the devil is right there to, to blow it up. Can I, do, do you not see it in your life? As soon as you do that, as soon as you get someplace in your life where you're, you're spiritual and things are clicking and things are good, you go like, it's good, and you put up that little white picket fence around the house and life couldn't be better, boom, there he is. Out to destroy it. Out to destroy it. And then after a while, you, 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 one of two things, either you surrender your sword or you go like, well, I, this, this is part of what, is, what it is. This is what it means to walk with God. <laughs> This is what it is. And so after a while, you get out. Bring it on. I care. I came in naked. I'm going to leave naked. And it looks like it's coming to pass right away. I mean, after a while, you got like, who cares? Well, I'll take your, I don't care. You can have it. God gave it to me. If he wants it back, he'll give it back. But look, you, I'm not going to just surrender it to you. You're going to have to come and fight me for it. I give nothing to you. Listen to what 1 John 3.12 says. Not as Cain, who was the evil one, slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. See, there's your war, evil versus good. That's, that's as old as the tree, isn't it? Huh? Evil versus good. We still fighting that war, aren't we, Horton? Jeez. It's all about how do you get to God. That's it. The battle started there and it never ended. Never ended. And, and, and what a good battle. Yeah. What a good battle. At Hebrews 4, uh, 11, 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about Abel. My kids one time said to me, what kind of epitaph would you like to leave, Dad? I mean, would you? I said, oh, I don't know. They said, would you like to have a library named after you or a street or... So I had to think about that for about a minute. 
Now that none of that's going to happen, so let me get practical here. <laughs> let me tell you, I want the one that God will give me. A testimony that lives beyond my death. And if it's about Christ, it will be because he's going to be here to the end of time. And so will I. And my, what I can leave my family, what I can leave my church, what I can leave my mark is just that simple thing. Just like Abel, whose testimony still speaks. Here we are in the 21st century, and we're talking about Abel. Whew. And what is that a picture of? That sacrifice, shadow Christology. Christ on the cross. Dying for our sins. Being buried and raised from the dead. Secession of the firstborn begins with Seth, the thirdborn, because God has a plan. In Hebrews 12, 24, it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, See, we belong to a new covenant genealogy that's all about Christ. And to the sprinkled blood in that inner, where'd that come from? Exodus 12, 22 doorpost business, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. <laughs> the blood of Christ. Hey, you want to know, you want to know a cross that had the visualness of of. The doorpost was the cross of Jesus Christ where the blood of God's Son was given for the sins of mankind, past, present, future. I mean, you talk about a gift. The exodus of, from Egypt was a phenomenal, miraculous thing. Nowhere near the redemption that came from Calvary, man. Listen, the blood over the door could only bring out those people that had a door. The cross. Whosoever believes. Whosoever believes. You don't even have to have a house or a door. Just got to have faith. Got to believe. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, reflecting on this very thing, Christ, our Passover. You know where that came from? Came from that Exodus, the Passover. That whole Passover business. Then it became a doctrinal thing in the, in the, in the church age. It became a doctrine. And he says, Christ is our Passover. Also has been sacrificed. Christ is our Passover. He's talking about the Passover lamb. Christ is our Passover lamb. Here's the third thing. We might get out a little early. My wife would like that. The second Messianic firstborn lineage that's important for us to understand because it's going to be fulfilled in Christ begins with Abraham and covers the post-Diluvian civilization of which we live. This is recorded in Matthew 1, 1 through 17. It goes from Abraham to the Babylonian captivity, from the Babylonian captivity to the birth of Jesus Christ. And is divided in 14s. There's 14 generations from Abraham to the Babylonian captivity, 14 from the Babylon. And he lays that out, right? He tells you that. With Abraham, and this is what's interesting about this, how this genie, how the firstborn genealogy shift and change in the post-Diluvian. With Abraham, where this begins, you know, it goes to Abraham to, uh, to David to the Babylonian captivity of Christ. He's, with Abraham, we have the seed of Christ. Galatians 5, 6, uh, 3, 16, the seed of Christ. Everything's about the seed of Christ. And this genealogy is all about that. <clears throat> the seed of Christ. And that's very important. The seed. And I, I gave you scriptures. Now, look, 
And we know that seed is going to be the son of God. Is going, his name is Emmanuel Business, you know, right? Like Matthew 1, 21. But look, he gets born and guess what the devil does? Guess what he tries to do? Murder him, right? Through Herod, Herod goes out, kills all the children under two in Bethlehem. You see why he's called the evil one? <laughs> Let me tell you. That's how you know. That's how you know the depth of the evil to what they will do. When you go after children to and under, I don't think there is a sensible person in the whole wide world, no matter what he believes in, doesn't believe that's evil. And the person that doesn't think that's evil is under the evil's one influence. That is evil. And of course, that came out of a, pro a prophecy of Jeremiah 31, 15. It shows the angelic conflict. Listen, we saw it in Adam. And here, now, we've gone through this whole genealogy structure to get to Jesus Christ, the firstborn of God. And the angelic conflict, war against God and his seed is still raging as, as, as well as ever. Agreed? I mean, it's alive and doing well in the angelic world. And let me tell you, if you think that it's changed because we're under a new covenant, it's heated up. It has heated up because he knows his day's done. Just the demons. All the demons knew it. You know, the head guy knew it. All the demons, every time Jesus came around, they went, oh, 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 oh. But listen, with David, a new, we have a new, with Abraham, we have a covenant. Agreed? And that covenant's really important, a covenant of Christ. When you have David, you have a new covenant. The, the new covenant is going to push this Abrahamic covenant and the seed in a different direction. Now, it's going to the cross, but he's going to push it a different direction through David. And now we're talking about a throne. We're not talking about a seed. We're talking about a throne. With David, it's all about a throne. When you go to, when you go to 2 Samuel, the seventh chapter, and talk about the Davidic covenant, it's about a throne. In fact, let me show you something. Go to Luke with me. Um, I probably put it on your paper. I don't know what I put on your paper anymore. Um, but in Luke 1, in 132, that put it in your paper? Uh, yeah. All right. Listen, and the angel's talking uh, to uh, Mary about you're going to give birth. You're, you say, oh, no, I, I'm not. I'm a virgin. They said, I know. That's why you're picked. Verse, verse 32, he will be great. He will be called the son. I mean, verse 32, he will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. When David came along, everything is now going to go kings. Right? Oh, gosh, we're studying this on, on uh, Wednesday nights, aren't we? In the life of Samuel. <coughs> Thank you. I thought maybe I was the only one that's got showing up. Um, so... Right? We got Saul, and then we got David, and what we are in is a theocracy monarchy, right? Yes. And listen, that's going to run all the way to, to Jeconiah, that, that is also called Coniah, and the curse of Coniah. That baby is going to run all the way to the curse of Coniah, which is 586 B.C. in the fall, right? And that's in Jeremiah 22. Oh, I don't know. I wrote down in what? 24... 24 through 30, you have the curse of Coniah, which means that that, that that's the seed that has now become the heir of the throne is stopped. And the next person to set on it is going to be Jesus Christ, is going to be the firstborn of God, and it is prophetically stated to Mary right here in Luke 1.32.
Now, when in, in Genesis 49, when we get to Judah, when we get to Judah, he's going to, he is going to describe this prophetically to Judah. Now, this is before, this before they leave Egypt. We've got 400 more years before we leave. Right. Here's what he says over here. Now, I picked up Judah, verse 8 through 12. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down because he's, it, Judah is the lion, right? He's identified that way. Genesis, and now Revelation 5, 5. Uh, but look, verse 10. The sepulcher shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. That is a reference to Jesus Christ. Until that one comes. Until the one that's expected, the one we're looking for, comes. That's really important. This is carried out in all, uh, and John picks this subject up in the, in the book of Revelation, just goes nuts with it. And what, what that's going to be is a preparation when Christ comes back and his kingdom comes will be what we call the second coming. It will be the millennium. All of that's prophetic. That's amazing to me. Who wouldn't like to study the Bible? I mean, that's just so amazing to me. All of those little pieces. And, and I've... I'm, How are you going to know that? I don't know. That's just my opinion. Psalm 89, 27. See, I, I said this earlier. I shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And he does that in Revelation 19, 16. And it reveals it in Hebrews 1, 5. firstborns lead us to Jesus Christ. That's Matthew 1 and Luke 3. So when we get to the new covenant and we get into guys like Paul and John who begin to really teach heavy on this, we hear things like this referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. We call it hypostatic union. Is the image. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. I mean, he's the fulfillment of it. This whole thing started from Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4. That Paul, Paul when he's in this passage in Colossians 1, 15 through 18, is dynamite. In Hebrews 12, 23, I don't know. Don, look that up for me. Some reason I'm thinking 24, but I don't know. I wrote 23, but who knows? To the general assembly and church. That'd be you, you know. You are the general assembly of the church? No, I know. That's right. 1223 is right. Okay. When we meet, listen, we are the church. Whether, whether you assemble or not, you're a church. If you believe in Christ, you're part of the church. Right? First Corinthians 12. But you know what's important to God? The general assembly. You're a general assembly tonight. This is the general assembly of the church. And the he writer of Hebrews picked it up in 1025 and said, never forsake it because your appearance and assembly is very important in the angelic world. Your appearance is very important. It shows your priorities. Shows you what where where your ducks are. Shows you where your ducks are. I'm telling you that. You know, people say to me, I've got friends that have retired. And they say, Ron, you need to leave. I mean, why you why do you go through all this and go down and teach a few handful of people that show up with you? 
Why do you do that? I mean, why don't you go, why don't you go to the Internet and, and, and preach to thousands and thousands of people? Well, I said I'm not opposed to that. But listen, my job is to teach the assembly because the assembly is a visualness of what's going on in the angelic conflict. My job is to teach the general assembly of the church. I wouldn't give that up for anything. It's just a matter of where he wants me to do it and who wants to assemble. Well, I'm going to do that because that's important to me. I mean, you can send a Bible to anybody. That's not what my gift does. My gift don't send Bibles. My gift explains it. And uh, I'm not opposed to all that stuff. I'm just saying it's not for me. I see this whole. Di I see this all different. I'm. I'm not boohooing these people to do that. I don't know how God calls everybody, but for me, the general assembly. I'm a face-to-face -face guy. I want to look in your face. I want to read your eyes. I. I want to be a part of what's going on in your life. I want to be part of the general assembly of the church. I'm not just interested in church. I don't want to be the pastor of the world church. Kind of. They've already got that guy. He's called Jesus Christ. I couldn't possibly keep up with everybody on a world stage. It's hard enough to keep up with a handful. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. How good is that? <laughs> We're enrolled in heaven. That was grace. I would have never had the brains to enroll myself. In fact, it would have probably threw me off a little bit if I was told I had to enroll. I mean, it frightened me when they said I had to join. <laughs> Therefore, I don't require joining to anybody because this scared me off like crazy. I figured that was just their way of saying, now I got you, I'm, I'm going to bleed you. And I don't know what it meant, but I know I didn't like it. So, don't mean it was wrong, it just means I didn't like it. Here's Romans 8, 29 in closing. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among us, the brethren firstborn among the firstborn <coughs> you know if Jesus was here tonight he would say to you oh don't get oh all you guys don't look at look <coughs> I'm not Elvis Presley you're looking at me like I'm Elvis Presley I'm gonna break out and sw swing my hips and <laughs> Uh, look, you're looking at me like I'm Elvis Presley. I'm not. Listen, I'm one of you. <coughs> I'm just one of you. I'm a son, you're a son. I'm an heir, you're an heir. I'm a priest, you're a priest. What I hope to be able to encourage you, he would say to you tonight, is that <coughs> you study the word and walk the course. Study the word and walk it out. Study the word, live it out. Learn it to live it. That's what I had to do. Had to learn to live it. So, well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll have our private prayer. For those that are visiting with us by the Internet, we encourage you to pick a night. We teach on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday. Pick a night and stay with me for a year. Don't jump all over the place. Just stay with me one year. Pick Tuesday or Wednesday or Sunday. Stay with that. Now, some of you got an appetite for more than that, and that's okay, but one. Don't flop all over the place with me. Stay one year with me. One year. That's all I'm asking is one year. And if God doesn't change your life through the Word of God, then write me a letter. Well, how, however you operate <laughs> through that Internet. And we'll talk. Father, we're so thankful tonight for your 
mercy, love, and grace. And thank you, Father, for these who came tonight and the freedom that we have to assemble because I know many of our friends on the Internet have to do all of this in secrecy, many of them. Great war against them. Well, let me tell you, God is greater. God is greater than a war. He, 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 listen, he don't talk anything but victory. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That would be what he would tell us tonight. And where does faith come from? It comes from hearing and hearing the word of God because it's the object on which God shows us his essence in our daily lives. So we thank you for it tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life.